when we are brought up in a, in a particular way of thinking that our cognitive function tends to lock in that worldview and it takes a lot of disturbing to crack it open and, and make yourself open and new. And it takes a lot of courage, actually. And uh, I think anyone that's made that shift, which is walking against the grain of, of the most dominant power in society, the big multinationals, your peers, your local uh, friends in your district, your Department of Agriculture, your universities, the whole thing, you're taking on an, an enormous establishment to make this shift. It's, it takes a lot of guts and that's what impressed me about these farmers. That was Charlie Massey and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an eighth generational Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for a yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day. Today's interview has been one of my, uh, one of the ones I've been looking um, forward to for so long. It's with the legend uh, Charlie Massey, uh, the author of Call the Rewarber, the one of the catalytic um, books of our time, published a couple of years ago now, but certainly made, making making waves across the globe. Um, today we talked about um, sitting here in Charlie's office at Seven Park near Cooma about um, oh all sorts of things. Um, nutrient density of food, um, transition to regenerative agriculture, uh, mental health, um, the biome and the the influence that nature has on the on the uh, uh, expression of genes. Um, we talked about the indigenous history of this um, beautiful landscape here, and Charlie's um, exploration of that and relationship he's building with nature. Um, there's too much to too much to bang on um, about in this interview that. Um, was absolutely wonderful, and what a what an honour to uh, to sit down with Charlie. And um, this is um, part one. Charlie Massey, welcome to your office. Welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, amidst your your work um, and in at, uh, at Seven Park, your home here near near Cooma, um, and we're sitting in your wonderful office looking at. Um, your garden, we get, we're getting glimpses of the landscape out there. I had a good view of it on the way through. And um, great to have you on the show. This has been, it's been in the pipeline for a while and we've done a few little interviews in the past on the on the machine there, on the phone. But this is very exciting. I'm very excited, Charles. Oh, good of you, mate. I think it's a great idea getting ideas out, both video and recording and this office was specially designed, so I wasn't in four walls. If you're going to get me into an office, I want to be able to see some nature through the window. We can see plenty of that. Yep. Now, before we um, – I'll start with the most serious question that I can think of. Is it Charles or Charlie? Because I'm a Charlie too, and depending on my behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with me. I'm Charlie until I'm naughty. <laughs> what <laughs> Fiona, Fiona will say, you know when she says Charles, Charles, you didn't pick up your dinner plate. That's right. The, uh, and then it's just the death that varies. <laughs> <laughs> and the tone. That's right. Accompanied by a stern look. Yep. Yeah, I think we're um, we're seeing out the same book there. Yep. Charlie, tell me about, <clears throat> about Seven Park or what it means to you. I want to get a sense of, I guess, um, where we are, location, geography, and, and, and your place in it, we are in your office, um, which obviously conjures up all sorts of, um, you know, notions of work and numbers and computers and stuff. But what are we seeing beyond that? What, are we, what does it mean for you to look upon um, this landscape sitting here? Well, a combination of things. <clears throat> it's a challenging landscape. We're um, bottom end of the southern tablelands, so we have to our west the main mountain range in Australia, um, Snow Mountains Range, which means that we have an orographic rainfall. It means we've got a rain shadow effect 
when the mountains are getting snow and when you want the rain coming into a spring, we have a dry winter. So our our um, rainfall is a sinusoidal curve, if you like. It's uh, hollow in depths of winter and to peak in the summer. So we only have really six months growing season on the southern tablelands where we are. We can get frost down to minus 14, 15 and 40 degree days. So um, and no rain and until the spring. So you've got to really be a very precise landscape manager in um, <clears throat> planning when you lamb or carve and um, uh, how you conserve your feed because uh, six months no growth. Uh, if you think about a factory inventory and we do a stock take at what we in, call the end of the growing season just before uh, end of April because we know uh, whatever feed we've got on the ground then has to last us to well into September and you add in a, another month in case of a drier season, you've got to allow for pregnant animals, feed requirements doubling, all those sort of lambs, etc. So um, luckily with modern regenerative agriculture, we've got some excellent tools to do those sorts of bit feed budgeting. And uh, if the season really dries off, we've got some other sophisticated tools of tracking our carrying to the season at any time. And I use a, a graph of 10% higher than the average normal running. Once the, the red line goes over that, we start making early sell decisions. And um, so you don't end up bearing your country and, and, and uh, destroying your, your, your landscape function. So uh, quite often in the last few years, we've had to do that. We've had a shocking dry run. So two years ago, that danger trigger point from my records said we're getting into danger territories. So we were able to sell sheep while they were still fat and the markets were still good instead of hanging on like I used to in my mistaken early management days when I would have, in, for example, 1982. I didn't know how to manage trout, didn't know many things. I learnt the hard way and, um, and it got worse and worse. And I said, I'll hang on with our most valuable asset is our genetics. Whereas in fact, it's actually your land, your landscape. But I hung on in, under that false belief and we bared the country, so we fed ourselves into a huge debt. And then when I did decide to sell, the sheep weren't fat and the markets were poor. And, and in one semi-trailer load of sheep, I had to send a check in with them because the freight was worth more than that, the animals were worth. So uh, you live and you learn. Um, and Charlie, you, um, I want to get back to, I guess, the the Indigenous connection and, and the, the history and, and the research you've been doing. Um, I want to go a bit further than that. Can you, you, you grew up here at Seven Park. What was, what was your, I guess what I'm trying to get a sense of, the, your, your growing up, the sort of the influencing factors that led you to then farming as you used to farm and then there was sort of a turning point and there were some things that happened. What, tell me about life here at Seven Park. Yeah, if I can just finish with your earlier question. Uh, um, I've described the um, physical climate, etc. Mm. But this is a very old landscape, um, say compared to Europe. Um, our younger soils are about forty million years old. The basalt, it's pretty old. Um, but our older soils are half a billion, <laughs> um, and our granites are about four forty million. So that, that that allows a lot of time for the nutrients to be eroded. Some of the oldest soils in the world are in Western Australia. They're three point eight billion, which is three quarters of the age of the Earth. So that'll relate to some discussions we'll have later of how the Europeans came here uh, under huge misunderstandings of how this land would behave. The other thing I just make before I get onto your question is um, this was probably anywhere between fifteen and twenty five thousand years of indigenous care, landscape management before we came. And the Monero has a shocking record on what happened with indigenous people and the district still in denial over massacres and things. <clears throat> anyway, that's by the by, but it does relate to the fact that I've tried to learn from, uh, lucky to find some elders who are <clears throat> happy to work here and uh, teach me a lot of things because I'm in kindergarten with that. So how did I get farming? Well, grew up an only child. Um, 
So my mother died when I was about four and a half. Um, so I became pretty self-sufficient. So from the age of six, seven and eight, I was pretty much alone hunting rabbits with dogs and then I, out, out in the paddocks and then um, took to the bush, quite comfortable to camp up there by you know, 11 or 12 on my own and track and hunt and all that sort of stuff. So got a deep love of nature. I was very privileged at school when I was about nine. I had a fantastic teacher who was mad keen on bird watching. And he inducted me into that and gave me a lifelong love of both ornithology but also nature in general. So then I um, had a couple of years home before I went to uni. Um, that wasn't too enjoyable. My, my father and I didn't get on 100%. He was, he was a good father but strict and um, I was probably a bit wild and woolly. So I went off to uni and... Um, about two and a half years into my zoology degree and doing human ecology, which was the first course in Australian holistic thinking, which had a profound impact on me. It was very new then. Um, he had a major heart attack and so I came home and took over the farm. <clears throat> Must have been about 22 or something. So didn't complete the course? You yeah, I did. I went did. back, finished part-time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and added bonus was I was courting my my well, my future wife at the time, so that was an attraction to keep finishing. <laughs> you should thank her for absolutely fi you finishing the course. I thank her for lots of things. <laughs> um, so just because you grow up on a farm doesn't mean you know how to manage it. Mm. And um, so I, I was just catapulted into it and uh, – about 10 days into taking over, trying to get a hold of where the sheep were. My father thought he was dying at the time, but hung on for a little while, luckily, because um, he, he did give me good advice. But about 10 days in, I went out mustering one day and he's 40 dead wieners in the paddock. And um, there's a, a particular intestinal sheep worm called Barber's Pole, which had struck in the autumn of thin. won't go into the details, but the worms thrive. So that was a hard welcoming and so I determined to read what I could which is all traditional industrial research and literature um, propagated by the Department of Agriculture all those scientists and extension officers really thought they were doing the right thing talk to the the best in inverted brackets farmers in the district and so I really set out to become a good traditional manager I did okay I guess um, but without any understanding of the soil and the complexity of nature that I was managing. <clears throat> and then we walked into the five-year drought of the 79-83 period and a story I told about sending the sheep off. I, the country just got bare and bare and the dust blew and mentally, physically exhausting stuff. You know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Um, and it was at the end of that with a debt, total exhaustion, belted landscape, I said, yeah. uh, thinking like a European, this is a soft, lush landscape where it always rains, it's just crazy. Um, it's not working. And so that, that was really the start of me starting to change my thinking. And, and, and it, despite the fact I love nature, I, I still didn't see what I was doing as a farm manager was completely at odds with that, what you call biophilia. Did you did you at that time um, think I want to get out like this? You know, you got a choice: you can stay and change, or you can just bugger off and you know, leave farming. Yeah, because when I went to uni, I wanted to become a uh, what's called an ethologist, a wildlife researcher. I wanted to go all over the world and remote places. But um, I guess a feeling of family responsibility. My, my father still alive by um, the early eighties. I didn't think um, I knew it'd kill him if I. Said I'm gone. So, uh, and I don't regret that the right decision. Mm. Um, and but it took a, a while yet before because I got caught up in sort of cutting edge uh, merino sheep breeding using molecular genetics and uh, a lot of biology and stuff like that in a very conservative industry. So I, by that stage, I could see um, I was starting to learn about paradigms and um, power all those things that infiltrate um, industrial society and uh, traditional rural societies. <clears throat> and uh, so I guess it, on my back was getting up that um, we had some pretty reactionary, old-fashioned thinking in things like merino sheep stud breeding. 
um, but also in, in the way we're treating the land. So I thought I'd have a real crack at trying to change the industry. And, and we did. I was involved in evolving a new type of sheep with some scientists, which today um, we became pioneers of not having to mule sheep, animal welfare benefit, first sheep to do that, growing a beautiful fibre, and I did a lot of direct marketing with the Italian top Italian firms, and so that was a wonderful experience. But trying to run a, complete, a complex merino stud with a lot of embryo transfer and artificial breeding and, and the specific mating groups, it doesn't allow ecological grazing management, which is what this place was cry, crying out for. So and eventually I sold a stud for the simple reason I wanted to live longer. And when did you do that? When, when was that sold? It, uh, we would have sold it in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and then by then I'd, I'd already started to do some early courses from the early 90s in the new ecological grazing and did start to do a lot of reading, a reading. So, you know, I was starting to get my deep empathy for nature in sync now with management, but hadn't cool, fully flipped over until we sold the merino stud. So the next thing we did soon after that had sort of a national dispersal sale. Was that, that, that was that, I mean, it was a, was it a bittersweet kind of uh, thing? Yes and no. I had a lot of great clients I worked with because mm. we built our business on servicing clients. Um, I'd learnt the hard way uh, early in my career when I had a um, traditional sheep classer and when I decided he wasn't doing the right thing and replaced him, he took 95% of my clients away. Um, and I said, it's no way to build a business, that's sort of an ego mm. dependent. Um, but anyway, uh, the step after we got rid of the stud was we had a major clearing sale of all our industrial farm machinery, sold everything. Um, big tractors, I'd only been spraying pastures for two years, but I uh, got rid of the spray machine and um, and the big ploughs, all that sort of stuff, even the drought feeding equipment. So it was a bit like what Cortez did when he landed in Mexico. He burned, the, burned the boats. He, he, he scuttled the boats anyway. <laughs> the, 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 the mythology is he burnt them, but he actually scuttled them. And then he said to all his crews, well, now you're committed to the journey. <laughs> so we were committed. Um, Would we, you recommend that? That strategy to others bit, bit radical because now we're looking at um doing multi-species cover cropping to regenerate soil biology and um all i've got is a 1958 40 horsepower tractor <laughs> <laughs> but that's all i want actually yeah, for sure. the size of farm and, and going Probably through the gates we want and um have compaction that sort of stuff so but anyway that that was the journey that um um full of mistakes but that's the best way to learn in some respects and Charlie, stepping forward a little further into, um, I guess you know, the clearing sale, the selling the start, and understanding of the, um, you know, that there need to be more of a focus on the ecology. What, what were there? Were there some significant moments? You know, whether it's actually literally a moment where a paradigm was broken, or something you saw, or something you heard, or something you felt in the moment that. You know, was as you say in in um, called the rewarbler a tension event, it might have been a t more of a tension moment. You know that actually was a significant yeah. point point of point of change. It was more gradual in my case. I think the the first, first big drought of the eighties was that what I would call a head cracking event, because by the time I'd finished um, both undergraduate and then my PhD that I ended up doing was also in human ecology, <clears throat> so. If we're going to talk about humans on Earth, you've really got to understand how they impact our natural environment. So the concept of an intervisibility between we humans and our sustaining environment is, to me, it's just inseparable. And, um, and it teaches you holistic thinking. And, and uh, so it was that background that really led me increasingly, and the drought and then the you know, succeeding droughts finished it off. So... Um, it wasn't sort of like, a, in some cases, a radical event. It took, because I had the Merino stud, which was our major income source, I couldn't just sort of quit it until we were ready. But eventually we got there. But um, I think where you're leading, and I might as well anticipate it, it was... Um, <laughs> You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but I, it follows on from what I've just been saying. Um, 
I, I think this process, well, first of all, the need for a different approach to managing Australian landscapes became increasingly obvious because when I had a merino stud, I had two or 300 clients in every state in Australia. I was driving 70,000, 80,000 kilometres a year and I was just seeing this ongoing uh, slide down in the health of our landscapes, increasing amounts of bare ground. And, and then the, when the modern cropping came, huge millions of acres of bare fallows for the summer, all that sort of stuff in the Mediterranean cropping zone, which is a major cropping zone, uh, more and more clearing, more and more salting, dry land salting. So I knew things were wrong. And, um, and by then, having read a lot of books on, on a lot of the... Uh, great thinkers in, in regenerative agriculture, Aldo Leopold, that sort of writing. It wasn't specifically on regen then. It was just great thinkers on nature, etc. And that started to create a dissonance in me that uh, it was time I started to walk the talk. And um, so when we began doing that, I got really interested in this process of change. And so uh, through my original mentor, a wonderful lady called Professor Val Brown, who's still a close friend at 90 and wrote the forward to my first edition of my book, she'd been my tutor as an undergraduate in human ecology and she became my supervisor for my PhD. And what I, I did in that was to ask, and we were really looking at paradigms, worldviews, because that's what it's about. Um, the question was, why had they changed? And so I interviewed 80 of the leading uh, regen farmers across Australia and um, those that I could track down at that stage. And so I started this um, PhD in about 2008 when I was about 57 or 58 um, and finished it about four years later. And I can tell you starting a PhD at that later stage of life, um, I was way behind the 22-year-olds on the computer skills but I knew how to cut the corners a lot better. Um, but Can anyway. you give me some tips on that when after the show, after we finish? The major finding of that research was really stark and that was um, in about 60% of the cases, and I'm talking about a lot of the leading innovators, it had been a major life shock that had cracked that mind, that paradigm. If you think about a tortoise shell, it was like a big hammer blow cracking it open. Uh, and in the other 40-odd percent, it was a series of little factors probably, if, if they weren't already biophilic nature and time and um and there's one other piece of research that i tracked down in in, in learning the learning field in uh, usa and um, academic area and it supported that finding almost the same so there's something about when we are gro uh, brought up in a, in a particular way of thinking that our cognitive function tends to lock in that worldview and it takes a lot of disturbing to crack it open and, and make yourself open and new. And it takes a lot of courage, actually. And uh, I think anyone that's made that shift, which is walking against the grain of, of the most dominant power in society, the big multinationals, your peers, your local uh, friends in your district, your Department of Agriculture, your universities, the whole thing, you're taking on an, an enormous establishment to make this shift. It's, it takes a lot of guts, and that's what impressed me about these farmers. And um, what... For those listening who um, may may well be listening to try and get some some ideas about you know how to transition, they're thinking about it. I know a lot of listeners are, are people who want to even just get into farming, so they may not necessarily have those paradigms to sort of break in the first place. Which is, as David Mars says, is actually one of the best assets if that they have not growing up on a farm. Um, what you know? What would you say? Talk to me about sort of some of those the strategies for people to sort of um, who are farming, who want to change, can actually employ and, you know, um, not necessarily, you know, on-farm put a fence in there, but the thinking, the the, the challenges yeah. they find and the, and the courage, I guess, they're going to need to muster to do it. Key question. And look, it doesn't just apply to farmers. If you're an urban person who wanted to get into healthy food for your family's sake, how do you get access to it? Can you get involved in... Um, you know, community gardening schemes, the local farmers' markets, how can you relate? It, it's, it's, it takes the same courage uh, based on, you know, decent research and meeting the right people and a bit of luck um, to make the same shift. So it's, it applies bush or, uh, in the bush or in the city. Mm. Um, 
we're in a vastly better position today. I mean, when a lot of this movement started, you know, the new ecological grazing didn't come to Australia and that's the regenerative feel that's impacting most hectares because it's broad acre stuff. It didn't come here until 89 when a guy called Terry McCosker brought Stan Parsons who'd worked with Alan Savory who evolved it and, and the Savory system didn't come in for a few years. So mm. things like biodynamics might have been around longer but those, those broader acre new cropping and, re, and grazing systems are only pretty recent. And so those early pioneers were really had not much support to go to and, uh, and so they were able to go to some early courses. Today uh, there's a plethora of courses right across the field. There's very sophisticated social learning um, systems set up in grazing, cropping, biodynamics, agroforestry, silvopasture, the whole whole box and dive. And in and in the city now, there's there's you know CSA. Uh, community supported agriculture systems, box schemes, um, urban gardens and the whole thing and, and relating to farmers markets and now more sophisticated things of trying to get young farmers onto farms near mm. the cities, etc. So it's it's an exciting time to be moving into it for all sorts of reasons we can touch on. But early on it was a lot more challenging. But the other really important thing that's evolved is that there's really a, a great amount of reading now around. Uh, and now we've had. You know any books on that that might be relevant? You know, you written one or not? Or, or sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not here to push my book, but <laughs> I am. Um, I, I certainly collated the stories. There's, there's yeah. a lot of good books in in the cropping and agroforestry and grazing stuff. So um, dozens of them. It's just a matter of getting into the right um, sort of booksellers. But it's um, it's it's a lot easier now. Mm. to get informed and and of course what you've got now we didn't have back in the 80s and 90s you've got um the computer power of youtubes and all those sorts of things and youtubes for example and and, and the equivalent of having a huge impact on bringing this message because you can tap into people all over the world and actually see what they're doing and uh, all those sorts of things so it's not just a written word it's uh, it, it's a really exciting phase and we can touch on why because uh if we don't get on with it, uh, our species is history, quite frankly. <clears throat> I do want to touch on that. Um, I see that the, the, I guess the points that are, you know, thinking about leading to implementation of some of these practices is, you know, getting to the point of actually picking up your book or pick or go or, or even looking online for a, an RCS course or an HM course. Is mm. that sort of moment of either curiosity gets the better of them, or, or there's too much pain. You know, they're, they're sort of pushed in that – they're sort of drawn to it, they're attracted to it, or they're actually pushed away from something else, which is a great situation I've I've found because that was sort of, I guess, more my experience was um, we have now and, and back when you changed, there probably wasn't that attractive force to something else because there wasn't much around. You'd been you – know, you, you knew a bit – it was innate and knew that there needed to be change taking place, but now I feel there's there's pain behind people. You know, like for me it was seeing my soils, my paddocks – Blow away, literally, and that was that was something that was pain to get away from. But also, there was pleasure to be gained, so-called pleasure or attracted attraction to something else. There was a push and pull going on, which is a really unique and wonderful situation. But that wasn't that probably wasn't your case. There probably wasn't. There was probably more pushing you, but to where? You know, how did you find where to go? Yeah, <clears throat> good question. Uh, let's go back a step. Um, what, what's driving this whole um, scene and discussion and why regenerative agriculture is so important? The, we've got to this stage uh, with the human species. I'll go back even one step. Uh, the modern form of Western agriculture, or not the modern form, but its origins, began about ten or 11,000 years ago in the Middle East and then they were adapted and taken to Europe. From that beginning of domesticating the first what were really weeds, the cereals, and sheep and goats very early domesticated and then cattle later, um, evolved the modern forms of agriculture. But it led to the rise of human civilization, Western civilization. And it took a while to... And then um, we'll, we'll touch on this later, I think, the mechanical and the organic mind, but it then led to the modern scientific revolution, etc. Be following the scientific uh, revolution of the you know, 17th, 18th centuries in the capitalist industrial revolution. We now find ourselves, and this is why the planet is in, is in deep shit, 
I can say that. You can say worse than that if you want. Say, but it is. <laughs> uh, did, it's in the most it? alarming state now. We, we, so that 10,000-year period, was about 12,000 years, which enabled agriculture to evolve, was when the, our planet came out of the Ice Ages, what is called the Pleistocene era, into the Holocene, that unique period of exactly the right carbon dioxide temperatures for things to grow, the right temperatures, carbon dioxide percentage, I mean, the right temperatures, the whole thing, and that's what enabled all that agriculture to get going. We now know, and the reasons I'm going to explain now, is we've now tipped ourselves out of that safe, secure period mm -hmm. into a new dangerous phase of much too high carbon dioxide, high temperatures, the whole box and dock. Um, the, what's behind that is that when we ended up that finishing that, and it was a, a unique and wonderful thing, the post the Renaissance, the scientific revolution, the rise of in capitalism and industrial capitalism, you know, quite remarkable for a species mm. to do that. And we've got to the stage now where we have this dominant world philosophy of neoliberal economic rationalism, which means you, the only way we can progress is to continue growing. Continue growing means continuing consuming, continuing destruction of resources and stuff. That dominant philosophy, though, comes from the, all the major governments, the world's biggest multinationals, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, energy, food processing. That flows to the governments and their policy. I mean, can you imagine a national Australian government saying, uh, we don't have to have growth, we've got to have sustainability? Um, God forbid. And, that, <laughs> and then it flows to government policy, it flows to university teaching and policy, it flows to the Department of Agriculture. So the whole mm. dominant paradigm is driving us to this industrial... Health? You mentioned health? Absolutely. Well, yeah. I didn't, but absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's what is driving all this. So to stand up against that and say, hang on, because when you shift to regenerative agriculture or to trying to source all your food, if you're in the city, from healthy, grown organics, farmers' markets and stuff, you're actually saying, I don't agree with, in effect, you're saying, I don't agree with this dominant world philosophy that is destroying both the planet and human health and our landscape. And so that's really the big background here. And, and uh, it's sort of, yeah, let's not go there. But that's what's behind it. And so the result now is that we have tipped our planet because of that over... It's, it, see, I, I know this is a big picture, but I think this is so important mm. because it's, it's now becoming more and more relevant. Our planet Earth um, is sustained uh, by nine integrated Earth systems. It's not just climate. There's uh, biodiversity. Yes, there's climate. There's the water cycles. There's... there's land use and function, there's the integrated nitrogen phosphorus cycle, there's, there's the oceans and, and their chemical health. Uh, we've destabilised uh, all nine, some of them very alarmingly, into almost a stage where there could be in runaway events. You know, the, We're currently into the sixth greatest extinction event on Earth of all species, that's human caused. This year seems to have ex even accelerated that a little more. It, it does, and, and climate now is really becoming manifest, even to the... Uh, Worst of the deniers, you, you can't now deny it. And uh, same with overuse of water, destruction of land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, and the exciting thing is, because uh, I've been privileged to work with um, some wonderful people, and one of them is Paul Hawken, who's been one of the world's leading social and environmental thinkers for the last three, four decades. Uh, as, as a young reporter, I think he even was covering Martin Luther King when he walked over that famous bridge. So that sensitised him to the social. I mean, anyway, cut a long story short, he got sick of, um, as, as I understand it, everyone saying, oh, isn't it dreadful? We're, climate's getting worse. We're putting out too much carbon dioxide. So he got together 70 or 80 scientists and said, well, let's come up with the best solutions to pull down carbon dioxide and put it away, reduce the level. And they published a worldwide bestseller, uh, called Drawdown. And uh, when I had a good look at it, 70 or 80 scientists working on this, the top 20 solutions on, on numbers, half of them are regenerative agriculture. And so I said to Paul, um, put them all together, call them Regen Ag. We're number one by a country mile. <laughs> by 2.4 times. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Only because you told me. Right. <laughs> and, um, and so they're... That's, the, but that's significant, isn't it? It's... it's 
unbelievably exciting. Mm. I mean, re- who'd have thought? Turning yeah. around our soils and our landscapes mm. and our urban gardens and more green space can actually have the best solution to the greatest planetary crisis we've ever seen mm. in in while well, life's been on it, uh, hu- humans have been on. It. So, um, so his next book that they're working on in, in a big way, a uh, similar number of analysts, is called Regeneration. And uh, the first cool. third will, will, a key part will be on farming, regenerative agriculture. So this is big picture stuff translated down to on the ground. So we farmers and the consumers that support us um, can play an unbelievable role and, and the urban gardeners, et cetera, in really addressing these big issues. And if that's not exciting, I don't know what is. Um, let's talk about, I want to know what you were put here to do, Charlie. Talk to wonderful interviewers <laughs> like you. <laughs> Not that. On a Saturday, you could be doing a thousand other things, so I appreciate that if I didn't say that up front. But what do you think if, you know, if you were, um, <laughs> if you were asked, I just did, what were you put here to do? I don't know if I was put in here to do anything, but look, um, through a, a combination of circumstances, and, and I, I guess along that journey we've been discussing, I, I got interested in writing. Um, as we all writers, we wrote some terrible crap in the early days, but that's that's how you learn what goes in the bin. And then got into a bit, you know, lucky to publish some books. Um, and I, I realised that as a species, we're made for story sitting around the campfire, uh, it's a story that cuts through. Um, and if you can cut through to the basics that uh, touch our hearts, uh, our subconscious, because uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that when modern humanity evolved, maybe it's debatable a quarter of a million years ago, the final version of Homo sapiens sapiens, why we're called doubly wise is beyond me. <laughs> it's not because we're doubly smart. It's no, it's it. certainly not. But there's evidence to show that deep in our subconscious, um, we're sort of impregnated this um, react- reactivity, sensitivity to metaphors, which is story. Mm. And so I got into writing and um, being passionate about the more informed I got at uni and reading, uh, I felt, well, we've got to get this good story out, all these wonderful farmers doing regen stuff. And that's what led to my book, I guess, and ongoing writing. Is there any more, to, any more to it than that? You're a storyteller. Uh, yeah, well, you're telling a particularly significant story. Yeah, the story. Yeah, I am. It, it, um, I, I realised that if if I could write a book that wasn't too academic, um, it's got to be. You've got to have a well researched, so it's got um, solid platform to defend mm-hmm. itself. But if I could get from these great innovators their stories, their aha moments, their sad and terrible stories and, and try and bring in nature with it, that might be one of those sort of cut-through approaches to touching people's hearts and minds and hitting those metaphors that might trigger change. And so that's really why I set out to write the book. I realised I, I couldn't do another heavily academic, scientific thing if, if uh, I wasn't going to access the people that need it. And so um, – it's the old story in writing or art or anything. You can't pick timing. And um, I just fluked it, I think. That's why it's sort of uh, gone into a lot of reprints and I think in Australia sold well over 20,000 now and going into audio versions and other editions. So, uh, and it's not a, you know, it's not a 50-page book. It's a big story, big book. It's a big book, but um, <coughs> it's, it seems to have touched a it's, – it's filled a, a gap just by luck, really. You know what? That's a load of bollocks. It's not luck at all. It is. Timing is luck. Luck is the confluence of preparation and opportunity. Yeah, but, but it's also timing. But, that, that, which, but is, which is the opportunity. Right, okay. Anyway, whatever it is, let's not get into that. No, no, no but, but, but I'm, I'm just trying to pump your tyres up a little bit, only right. because, and I think it's well-deserved because I know you don't do it enough, um, being the humble fellow you are, that you were able to, to distill many years of information, experience, wisdom, knowledge into a, a book which is, um, which I believe, and, and not just me, I can't tell you how many people have, have just mentioned this, that that publication, that's, that collection of stories and the way you put it together in such a, such a wonderful way has been the catalyst for so, so many people, doctors, 
chefs, um, you know, um, nurses, um, and the list goes on of people that aren't farmers, right? Someone might think, oh, this is, you know, a book about farming. Well, it, it is, but it isn't. You know, it's so much more than that. So, yes, the timing was good because we were at a point where there were decisions that people are needing to make and some, you know, yeah. choices. But I think that the way that you you pull that together, I don't know anyone else who could have done it with your experience of the of the topic and the connections and your your compassion compassion as much as anything for the for the people that you spoke with to, and to pull that together and the courage to do that. Yeah. No. Look. Thanks, mate. Um, just remember though, if you pump tires up, they can always get a punch if you let down. <laughs> We're talking about that. Yeah. Um, what you know has there, and if there has been, what what what's been the cost of that, of of, of the of uh, you know, dare I say notoriety or the 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 you you in the world now? Oh, so and I mean I say the world because it is in the yeah, world. I, I mean, um, there's been a lot of benefits. I've been I've met some wonderful people, done a lot of travel locally, international. Uh, you know, some of the wonderful people involved in in. Organisations like Landcare, you know, um, busy working mothers and fathers, but a lot, a lot of them um, wonderful women that are driving that from their hearts and uh, internationally being able to speak and meet great people. Um, you know, the Paul Hawkins and others of this world, Zach Bushes. Um, that's uh, so many upsides and your learning journey accelerates. You get exhausted on that international national circuit, uh, and the downsides are the inevitable attacks. Some, some pretty vicious stuff comes your way, but to me, that's a sign that uh, we've got them worried um, because there's still a lot of extraordinary stuff going on that needs to change. You know, I, I was giving a lecture the other day at a certain university. They asked me down, the, the agriculture department wouldn't have a bar of me, but the environmental This group, is in Australia? In Australia. Yeah, yeah. And some of the students that did the agriculture course came along and said, well, actually, uh, it's a bit new to us, all this soil biology stuff you're talking about, because our lecturer told us that our role, our soil lecturer told us that our role was to kill all the soil biology, then you can control all your inputs. And I sort of nearly fell off the chair. But <laughs> it's that sort of reactionary... It was that Frankenstein professor. In, ...industrial <laughs> thinking that... Um, it, it's, gets really um, exacerbated when someone they see as radical and crazy comes along. And, and so I've gotten a little bit... But, I mean, that's inevitable. If you don't... If you're going to put your head up a bit, you're going to get shot at. And um, to me, that's... If it wasn't happening, you haven't got to worry. Well, as they say, if you don't have a few enemies, you're not having a go. Well, that's right, yeah. And who who are they? You mentioned them. We've got them worried. Who, who apart uh, from I'd, crazy I'd, professors, what, what who I'd, else? I'd, I'd, Without naming names, of course, but just the, the general sort of... People with a particular paradigm. Who? Who? What sort of Ten, paradigms? Are tends like? to be more university and, and Department of Agriculture. And, and look, these, a lot of them are people that have dedicated their lives to a certain pathway. And mm. uh, someone comes along that could threaten to pull the rug from it. They're going to react. So that's the way I read it. Um, probably leave it there. That's all we <laughs> say. We know they are out there. Um, let's get back to here to Seven Park yep. and that amazing courage on that. Um, many people would have read about um, in the call of the Reed Warbler and certainly in any number of videos and interviews you've done. Um, tell me, tell us about that. We, we're looking at it right now and it's quite a magnificent tree. Um, tell us about the significance of that one. Well, the first thing when I look at this lovely native Australian tree is it uh, normally doesn't belong here. Mm. It won't grow on this tough Monero. So, and I grew up with two of those, one died. And um, I didn't know better. And then um, part of my journey was a realisation um, that, in effect, we, we farmed on stolen country. Um, and the Indigenous story on the Monero, it's pretty horrific. Um, they're pretty well through massacres, mainly, and small and isolated shootings, uh, and then disease, some of which was deliberately brought in with infected blankets with smallpox and arsenic, strychnine poisoning, things like that in the flower. Uh, it was a pretty horrific story. And then the remnants, this is only within two or three decades, were shipped to a concentration camp on the south near Delegate. 
those that survived that were then shipped off to a coastal settlement and then sent up to Sydney to La Perouse. So it was pretty much an ethnic cleansing. No one talks about it um, still. And, and because there's not many Indigenous people on the, living on the Monero, you, you hardly see an Indigenous person. So growing up as a white kid, um, I just wasn't sensitised to that until I went to uni. And um, so I realised by the time I got myself into this new thinking space that I had to engage and understand and, if possible, try and work uh, with Indigenous people. And I, I was lucky to befriend a, a senior lawman of the local Ngarago people whose actual clan country is this country. The Monero is divided into about seven or eight clans, but this is... And so he, he'd done some... Uh, he, training in ecology, and that's apart from his native learning of ecology, which is ten times better than anything <laughs> I did at uni. Um, and so I, we began engaging with him, and the first time he came here was with a group of white ecologists, and they parked the car just out past that car I'm Sorry, and why did they come here? Did you invite oh, them? Or yeah, we, we, we were working yeah. with ecologists. We, I've been logging our bird species and mm. uh, things over dec many decades, and, and they came... To, um, to do a survey and see what was going on and we wanted Rod engaged and um, that's developed into other things, working with New South Wales Conservation Trust, etc. Biodiversity Conservation Trust. Anyway, Rod got out of the car and walked up and then I could see him spot this car, John. And he walked over to it and, and got very emotional. Uh, he's about my age. And um, you know, I eventually got the story from him that... Um, it was a cultural tree. Many Karajongs in Australia are cultural trees. They've been spread by Indigenous people mm. and lately a few white people. And, um, and then he showed me um, on the tree these, these long scar marks and that was where Aboriginal women had pulled off the fibres. Karajong bark makes a very strong fibre, fishing line and nets and stuff, as well as it being a food and other resource tree. <clears throat> and uh, so that was a real eye-opener. And, and so that tree is of enormous importance. We've tried growing some more, but with our minus 14, 15 frosts, we're going to have to do a better job. The drought's killed off 10 we've planted and we'll have to have another go. And I'm thinking this is granite country. That meant it was thick grassy woodland before the whites cleared it. They, they probably planted those carajongs under thick wattle and, and they had protection. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that journey, I'm only in the kindergarten with Rod and he comes here now. Uh, every now and then, and we spend time up on country and um, around a campfire. And I'm just in kindergarten. I, I'm in awe of their ex his extraordinary knowledge on how to burn. We've run uh, cultural burning workshops here with him. Uh, and the more time I spend with him, and I visit him out on the coast whenever I can. And in fact, I've just helped him with a story under his name and his story that will appear in a major international journal. So that's been a bigger learning even bigger learning curve, just getting him to tell his story that goes back really um, 30,000 years. I mean, culturally, they've got stories of hunting diprotodons, the giant wombats. Yeah, the megafauna. Uh, the megafauna. And um, <coughs> because their oral tradition goes back, that, you know, they can remember uh, the Ice Ages and stuff mm. through his story. I mean, it's, it's boggling. And so that knowledge of his, his reading of country, how to burn, how it worked, how they used to manage it with fire and uh, uh, and those and those other techniques is, is uh, just quite extraordinary. And um, I realise really I'm in kindergarten when I work with him. Is his that's passed down uh, um, on the maternal side? Is that how it works? The, 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 it's more the the the, the, the mums and you know the 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 females. Um, you know. Tell the stories. Is that is that how it's sort of the, no that's both both and, it, it yeah. depends on their clan system okay. and, yeah. and their sort of what I call the moiety structures and uh, mm. but it's it's what Bill Gamage and Bruce Pascoe but particularly Bill Gamage with his greatest estate on earth talked about that uh, you know we know there's at least two hundred and fifty individual uh, indigenous nations each mm. with their own language yeah. And, and the countries that they occupied were distinct ecological units. That's what's really exciting, that these people had evolved over thousands of years, management techniques and knowledge that applied to that country. Mm. Um, and flexible enough that if one particular piece of country was in shocking drought, they were able through relationships and skin groups to be able to be taken in by other people. Uh, it's just the most extraordinary 
story that I think we've got a lot to learn from. And Bruce Pascoe's um, Dark Emu was another eye opener, wasn't it, in terms of his yeah. deep dive into farming? Yeah, and look, there's been another couple of great books just come out by Indigenous people. Victor Stephenson's on burning. Yep. And uh, Tyson Yankajaro's book Sand Talk is just quite mind boggling. Sand it's Talk. Sand Talk. We'll so, put all these in the show notes yeah. too. So there's some really excellent Indigenous thinkers now writing in this space that. Uh, Takes a lot to get your head around, but realise, wow, we're, we're in kindergarten. And Charlie, when given your your you know sort of newfound or heightened, I guess, appreciation of the history and oh, trees, um, you know the the sig- significance of trees like that, Karajong, How is that? How has your sort of relationship with the landscape changed, or has it changed over time? Is it is it still evolving? Your you know, and how do you how do you do you look at that landscape differently now? Oh, totally, and and it's um, constantly evolving. Mm. Um, every season's different. Um, you try and minimise your mistakes. Uh, we're, we're through our ecological grazing. We're trying to get um, from the overgrazing, the rabbits, some of the pasture improvement on the granite country. We destroyed a lot of the native grasses. All our granite country is grassy woodland. They they totally overcleared it. So. Trying to get some functionality, ecological functionality, back into it. We've planted uh, sixty odd thousand trees and shrubs, sort of local provenance, enough mixture to get full function. And by that I mean um, insects, birds, reptiles, actually doing the pest control, etc. And I'll mm. give you an example of of that. Um, my father told me that when he came here in the late 20s through to the early 80s, about every seven or eight years we'd be wiped out by wingless grasshopper, almost instant drought. Yeah, yeah. And and they, they thrive on simplified landscapes, bare ground for their egg bags, no predators. Well, you know, the basic stuff of simplifying a complex system. Mm. And we should get on to complex adaptive systems. I'll write, I'll write that down. Um. And so when we then started to plant trees, initially all the mistakes I made, too, too few species, too narrow of the tree break because yeah. I thought I was saving country, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But eventually we've, we've, <laughs> we've fenced off bigger areas. We, we're growing wider tree breaks. We've got patches and mosaics and getting them linked up. Getting our ground cover up was huge. We haven't had a grasshopper attack since the – Mid late eighties, mm. but we know people not far away under traditional management are still getting wiped out. So, and I can go for a drive. E- even the other day on a minus eight. Oh, keep going, Charlie. Just adjusting the video here. Time right. storage is full. Oh, I knew that was going to happen, didn't I? I told you. Damn. No way. Keep going. Right. Keep going. Push on. Even the other day on a minus eight. Uh, when I was going out on a bike getting frozen with the dogs, um, his spider's webs in the frosted grass and on the fence lines in July. So on a dewy morning in summer, spring, autumn and lesser in July, because not all f- spiders are that silly to pack their heads up in a minus eight or nine. <laughs> um, but it, it's nothing to see almost every grass with spider web on it. And so what's happened since we've got more into ecological grazing and landscape management is uh, we've had no wingless grasshoppers attack. That's, mm. if, if you take away the bare ground, they don't tend to lay eggs. And if it's moister because there's more water going in through more carbon and deeper roots, your nematodes will attack their eggs. And then you've got both in the grass with those spiders but in the tree breaks and stuff, you've got all those other predators controlling them. And that's, to me, that's why we just don't get hit anymore. And they're there, aren't they? There's There's a... I mean, it's not as though they've disappeared from the landscape. No, they are there in a, in a balanced population. You'll see they? a little hatching every now and then. Yes. But I don't know how I could put a monetary value on mm. not being wiped out every seven or eight years. That's uh, it. It's I mean, we used to do the same thing. I remember used to drive mum nuts because we'd get our sand shoes and squash them on the on the veranda. <laughs> yeah, that and the um and the caterpillars that fall out of the, the grape on the on the veranda, yep. squash them, they make a mess. Um, and that was great fun. And I remember one year we had green. Green canvas awnings out on the outside of the windows, and they ate them. Yep. All there was left was the aluminium. Yep. Structure. That's right. No, I, I, apparently, my, my father said that uh, 
mother hung a tablecloth on the line with green flower pattern. <laughs> and they just ate the green out of it and they ate the green paste, uh, paint on a round of posts. So, yeah, they're, they're programmed for green. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to deprogram them through ecology. Well, there you go. It's just part one of my interview with Charlie Massey. What a fascinating fella and such a wonderful opportunity to sit with him at Seven Park down there at Cooma and chat away. Um, look forward to part two uh, next week. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.